This clip from the SVLG Cities Matter Summit is brought to you by Google. Secretary, great to have you with us today. I think you know you have many fans here in Silicon Valley who have been cheering uh, your tremendous success in recent years. And uh, it is finally time for us to talk about Infrastructure Week. We waited a few years to get here, but thanks to the new administration, and your leadership, uh, we have the American Jobs Plan. And I want to talk first about some of the, the scuttlebutt in the media and Twitterverse, uh, undoubtedly that you've been uh, hearing plenty of. Uh, there's been a lot of controversy, certainly, around a very old book, uh, The Power Broker, and the discussion of Robert Moses' impact in New York City. And uh, you've been saying some things that have been getting some attention uh, about how highways have been built in the past. And uh, I think a recent quotation, uh, there was racism physically built into some of those highways, as you told one reporter. Can you tell us a little bit about how the lessons learned from infrastructure and how we built it in the past should inform us in how we make those investments today? Well, uh, thanks. First of all, Mayor, great seeing you. And uh, uh, thanks for guiding our discussion. Uh, and uh, yes, this is a time to reckon with issues that are literally physically built into our transportation infrastructure. Uh, a lot of folks online, it, it seems, were surprised by my discussing the ways that, that racism was encoded into uh, the structure of some of our roads and highways. Uh, but uh, this should come as a surprise to no one. If you look into our history, The Power Broker is one example, a book describing the work of Robert Moses a, a titanic figure in his time uh, who, uh, among the many good and bad things that, that he did, uh, encoded uh, racism in the form of highways literally uh, designed so that their overpasses were just a little too short for buses containing largely black and Puerto Rican New Yorkers to get to certain places. We need to understand that when highways were built uh, north and south, east and west, when highways were built directly through black neighborhoods or other communities of color, tearing them up in the process, that wasn't just something that was done uh, through carelessness. Uh, sometimes it was something that was done very much on purpose with the knowledge that a decision to segregate an area by running a highway through it as a kind of boundary was a decision that would be much harder to reverse than other kinds of policies. Now, I'm not discussing this in order to make everybody feel guilty. I'm discussing this in order to make sure we don't repeat those same kinds of mistakes and sins. And the, one of the many things I'm very proud of in the American Jobs Plan that the president's putting forward is that it contains resources, dollars to do something about it. Not only do we need to make sure that our future highway choices and transportation choices are equitable, we can also reverse some of the harms of the past with dedicated funds to look at communities that were divided, often with federal dollars, and reconnected. If a place got split up by a north-south highway that cut the city in two, let's run some east-west uh, connections to try to stitch that back together. My point is this is a chance to contend with that history, but first we've got to face it. Secretary, uh, a predecessor of both of ours, former mayor and Transportation Secretary Norman Netta, uh, often repeated the refrain that we've all heard that there's no Republican or Democratic way to build a, a bridge or, or a freeway. Uh, in fact, we're now hearing there's, there's plenty of uh, partisan bickering over how exactly we define infrastructure. Uh, and certainly uh, the plan that you have been a great champion of certainly has plenty in it for roads, uh, plenty in it for bridges and for dams. Uh, but there's also a lot of conversation about broadband. There's uh, funding uh, for everything from, from home care to, um, to other kinds of, I would say, more expansive views of infrastructure. Why is this administration taking a much more expansive view than past administrations have of, of what infrastructure really is? Well, I think this, interest, uh, this administration recognizes that we're at one of those moments where America has to make some very big choices about what our future is going to look like. But I would actually argue that this is part of a great tradition, too. Every big infrastructure choice that our country made, uh, building the transcontinental railroad, building the interstate highway system, 
every one of those choices, part of why it made such an impact was that it expanded our definition of infrastructure. Nobody thought trains were infrastructure until we started building them. Once upon a time, trains were one more newfangled technology. Now, of course, they're very traditional. And I would argue the same is true about broadband. I'd say it is just as important to have a connection to the internet as it is to have a connection to the interstate highway system if you want to survive and thrive in today's economy. This plan recognizes that, and I think that makes it that much stronger. Well, we certainly saw that through the last pandemic, or through this current pandemic, I should mm. say, uh, as millions of children were left without any access uh, to education uh, because they were on the wrong side of the digital divide. So thank you for that investment. As you know, it means an awful lot to folks here in Silicon Valley as well. Uh, you have seen some criticism already from, uh, for example, the minority leader who has criticized that there's not enough money uh, for roads and bridges, for example. Uh, do you suspect that there might be more funding for some of that traditional uh, infrastructure if this is going to be able to get any kind of Republican support? Well, uh, obviously, as the transportation secretary, if there are folks uh, saying we should uh, consider even uh, bolder investments, uh, we definitely want to listen to that. Uh, but I don't think that that has to mean uh, reducing or shorting uh, some of the other things that are in there. Uh, we view infrastructure as uh, what it takes as a foundation in order to thrive today. And yes, that means roads and bridges, but it also means the internet. It means having clean, safe drinking water. And we believe it also means making sure that you're not worrying constantly about being able to afford things like elder care. But I guess my message to, to some of the folks on, on the other side of the aisle is, we can agree to disagree on what to call it, on, on what category to put it in. We still think it's a good policy, and we're still asking for your vote. Uh, and now, of course, is the season where, uh, in, in the tradition of, of legislative negotiation, uh, we're going to have that back and forth, both about what needs to be in the package and how to pay for it. Uh, but I hope we don't back away uh, from the idea that we've got to make big, bold, urgent investments, and we've got to act now. Certainly, we've seen polling suggest there's, in fact, strong bipartisan support among voters uh, for exactly what you've articulated. Uh, do you think that's going to translate into actually getting any votes? I hope so. Uh, you know, we, uh, we see widespread bipartisan support among the American people, just not in Washington. Uh, and uh, that, that's a concern, but uh, better that than the other way around, because it means that all we're doing is asking elected representatives in Washington to catch up to where the people already are. Uh, you know, I could cite any number of studies or statistics uh, like the American Society of Civil Engineers giving us C's and D's on those famous report cards they do about American roads and bridges, but the reality is I don't have to go out there that much to persuade Americans that we need to do a lot of work. People get it. Anybody who drives a car or uh, uh, certainly anybody who's been through a U.S. airport and compared it to the best uh, airports of other countries around the world sees uh, in a very personal and direct way what it means for America to be falling behind. And if we continue falling behind, we're going to find that uh, strategic competitors like China and a lot of other countries uh, will leave us behind. Uh, we've got to make sure that we're positioning America to compete and succeed throughout the 21st century. And that doesn't just happen. You, you actually have to do it. And that's what this bill is about. Let's stick with roads and bridges for just a minute more. A lot depends on what exactly is driven on those roads and bridges. And the American Jobs Plan calls for investment in a half million electric vehicle charging stations. Uh, that is certainly welcome news to us here in Silicon Valley. San Jose has the broadest deployment of electric vehicles of any metro in the country. And so uh, we love to see that happen. Certainly we've got a lot of companies uh, that are very interested in that as well. Uh, how exactly do you sell that to the rest of the country outside of Silicon Valley? We know we're a pretty blue part of the country. Uh, how does everybody else get on board with this electric vehicle vision? Well, first, I want to applaud San Jose for, for your leadership uh, on electric vehicles. And, and we're seeing communities step up. Uh, but you should have a federal government that's supporting you, too. And the reality is uh, you, you can benefit from an electric vehicle no matter where you live, uh, whether it's uh, uh, in a coastal uh, uh, city or a blue state or whether you're in a rural area, especially when you consider the, the fuel savings that can go with it. Uh, now, in order to support that transition, we need to make sure we have electric charging stations around the country. Uh, and that's not something that'll just happen. I, I would liken it to the way that the American aviation sector really boomed 
uh, after the uh, FDR administration decided to make investments in a network of airports around the country. Same here. Look, uh, the federal government should not be in the business of uh, uh, owning and operating uh, car factories. We, we don't make cars. But we do make policies that help move those, those, those markets in the right direction especially because electric vehicles are increasingly on the rise around the world. We want to make sure those EVs of the future are built in America, on American soil by American workers, preferably union workers, uh, rather than uh, uh, having other competitors get ahead of us. This is an investment in getting that right, in making sure that those economies of scale kick in. And, and you know what, what we're seeing is the cost side is, is, is moving us more and more toward EV adoption. We're getting pretty close to where, you know, apples to apples, it's going to be cheaper for a family to have an electric vehicle. But that's not enough to make that change if you're not so sure about the range. If you're used to traveling long distances, which a lot of us uh, do as Americans, uh, then you've got to know that the charging infrastructure is there too. That's where we think there's a very important federal role. Secretary, you uh, just mentioned airports a minute ago, and of course, through this pandemic, we've seen the airline industry has been devastated. Uh, plenty of speculation. It may take many years for us to get to the same levels of uh, airport traffic. Does that affect how we invest in airports? Certainly, there's a lot of unmet needs in terms of capital placement and, and maintenance, uh, but should we be thinking differently about how we rebuild? Well, air travel is always going to be an important part of our economy, but things are certainly shifting and changing, and the pandemic has reminded us that uh, uh, the, the next normal may not look like the last one. Uh, first, I, I think we should pause and recognize the effect of the American Rescue Plan. I know we're always looking to the next thing, but that legislation that Congress passed, that the President put forward, uh, had a huge impact on helping support our aviation workers. And one, one of the best pieces of news I've seen since I took this job was when we heard about uh, companies telling their workers they could tear up those furlough notices because of the rescue plan. Now, when we look forward, one of the reasons the jobs plan includes a lot of dollars for, for upgrading our airports is that we, we do have to make sure that we have the best, safest, most efficient, more, most user-friendly uh, aviation transportation system in the world. Yes, we're going to see those patterns change, no question. And we can't predict everything about the future, but we can predict uh, that Americans will need to continue to travel by air. And uh, I just want American airports to be the envy of the world instead of uh, the other way around. As a former mayor, uh, you are certainly familiar with the intersection of transportation and housing. Obviously, you're not the Secretary of Housing, but you are the Secretary of Transportation. And can you say a little bit about how you think this administration, particularly under your leadership in, in, in this department, is going to view the relationship of transportation investments and the housing we need in our communities? Yeah, I'm so glad you raised that. Uh, of course, as a mayor, you don't get to think about housing one week and then deal with transportation the next week. The, these things uh, are hand in hand and you deal with them every day. And I think we ought to have the same approach in the administration. Uh, so I think ab about these connections a lot. I've spoken uh, to my counterpart, Secretary Fudge, uh, in the Housing and Urban Development uh, uh, Department about this. Uh, because you know, part of how we plan for the future is making sure people can live and move uh, in a way that's affordable. Another thing that, that, that's uh, helpful is to actually add up uh, the housing and transportation cost as a share of a family's budget and see how high it goes. For far too many low-income families, it's above 40%. Uh, fixing that, getting it back below that, we can't do that on the housing side alone or the transit side alone. We've got to do both, and it's one of many reasons. I'm glad the jobs plan includes resources to double transit in this country, something that will benefit big cities and small, especially as we pursue more transit-oriented development. Uh, so people can live in ways that, that work for, for where they need to go to school or work. And I think most of us, in terms of the way we live, are less concerned about the number of miles than we are about the number of minutes between where we are and where we need to be. That and the dollars it takes to get there. Uh, solving that, that means an integrated approach like you and other mayors take every day. And thank you for the emphasis on investment in transit. Uh, although some may say California has a car culture, uh, you better believe we are investing heavily. In fact, uh, with the help of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, uh, we have taxed ourselves four times in this county to pay for transit just in the last two decades. Uh, we've got big ambitions around expansions of major systems like BART, around uh, high-speed rail, being able to connect the jobs of Silicon Valley with the affordable housing in Central Valley. Uh, how do you think this plan is going to really impact our ability uh, to be able to build out communities um, that improve the equity 
uh, that is so essential now that we're seeing this divide get wider and wider in communities like ours. Well, this is a matter of convenience, affordability, but also equity and justice like you described. Americans of color are more likely to depend on public transit, and those who do are more likely to uh, require more time in order to go about their day. Uh, it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, matter of fact, a, a healthy, prosperous country uh, is one where people of all income levels find a lot of value in their transit resources. And as you've said, you know, a lot of communities are willing to do it, raise the revenue, take the steps uh, to make it happen. We need to have that attitude nationally as well. Uh, and the more we take those steps, uh, the more it goes hand in hand with the climate goals we're pursuing with electric vehicles. Look, no matter how good we get at electrifying our vehicle fleet, we also have to give people alternatives to being in a vehicle at all. Uh, you shouldn't have to drag two tons of metal with you everywhere you go. Uh, we need to make sure there are good options for people. Yes, good options to drive, but also good options to get around on foot or on a bike or active transportation, and definitely good options on transit, whether we're talking about light rail, uh, low or no emission buses, or anything else that gets people to where they need to be. Secretary Pete, you've been so generous with your time. Last question I just wanted to pose. Uh, since we have both been mayors, we both know that people will cling uh, to their parking spaces like it is a constitutional right, uh, but you have been seen on a bike. I know many times out there in Washington, D.C., as well as in South Bend. Uh, tell us a little bit about planning for bike infrastructure, why this should be more than just an afterthought in transportation investment and transportation planning. Yeah, I think this is really important. I, I love biking to work uh, often as a mayor. I even do it here in D.C. some days. And uh, what we're seeing is that uh, our, our cities are catching up, but uh, in, in kind of an uneven way when it comes to bike infrastructure. Uh, the truth is the more people commute by bike, actually the safer it gets because uh, vehicles start to take that into account and everybody's just used to it. Uh, but we've got to build for that. We've got to plan for that. And that's something that, that can work in big cities and small. And importantly, uh, it, it can work in, in communities with beautiful weather like yours. But uh, when I traveled to Northern Europe with one of my predecessors, Secretary Anthony Fox, to learn about their bicycle infrastructure back when I was mayor, uh, we learned a saying they had in Denmark. They say there, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. It, uh, it rhymes in Danish. And, uh, and they're one of the most bike commuter friendly countries in the world. So if they can do it up there with those long, uh, dark uh, winter nights and, and their kind of weather, then we should be able to do it anywhere in the U.S. if we make the right choices. They're happening at the local level. We've got to back them up with federal dollars and federal support. Secretary Pete Buttigieg, it has been a great pleasure to be with you. It's also a wonderful man to see you just sitting in and out of the park. So please continue to do great things leading our country. Thanks so much. Great seeing you, too. Great to be with you.